Hello, this is Eric Boyce, CEO and Chief Investment Officer for Boyce & Associates Wealth Consulting, and welcome to Charts & Chat for September 25th of 2023. I thought I'd begin the chart pack this week with a bit of a discussion on financial conditions and, and also on bank lending standards. So we've got a lot of this kind of interspersed in the chart pack this week. Uh, we actually have another version of monetary tightening uh, impacts coming up in a, a few slides down the road. But this is uh, an assessment by, by Goldman Sachs. Um, a, a lot of different folks have financial conditions indices that they publish that have different components or calculated slightly differently. And this is just one iteration of that. And so Goldman here is making the case that the, the drag on growth from tightening is kind of mostly behind us. And so, you know, Goldman has been very vocal about uh, their probability of recession, you know, being reduced to like 10% now. They're very much in the camp of having a, a soft landing. And, there's this endless debate out there about, you know, what's the lag period between, you know, when you raise rates and when that impacts the economy. And so we've got a lot of stuff in the chart pack this week that's kind of like, okay, this data point really suggests recession. This data point, however, really suggests a soft landing. And so there's no consensus out there whatsoever. And this chart is very compelling because it, it would tend to suggest that the the impacts from tightening and tight bank lending standards is behind us. You know, I tend to think that this, um, you know, maybe uh, it, it gets pushed out a little bit more into 2023 and 2024. I mean, when you look at the, you know, the financial conditions index, they've been pretty tough, but the consumer has been very strong year to date and has really been the big surprise in 2023. They keep spending, retail sales haven't you know, they haven't dropped off like people had thought uh, and, and real incomes have gone up. And so uh, you, you look at these financial conditions uh, and the drag on the economy, you know, if this chart's right, then 2024 is going to be a fantastic year. Uh, if you look at another chart that I have to offer you uh, a little bit down the road, then you say, OK, fine, we're in the midst of this now and the drag will kind of ease up at the beginning of next year. I, uh, next year. I just wanted to show you this. You know, as as a uh, you know as a starting point for that conversation about what really do we think about the end of this year and the beginning of next year, and along with uh, tighter lending standards comes higher interest rates overall. And I think we're seeing that right now. I think there's uh, very much uh, an uh, an impulse out there that we're going to have higher for longer, that uh, these uh, uh, rate cuts that have been priced, uh, had been formally priced into uh, the investment markets uh, over the last uh, six months or so are, are really probably not as likely to materialize now. Now, you know, I think the, uh, the market was pricing in about 100 to 150 basis points of, of uh, interest rate decreases for 2024. And that's really dropped down to about 50 basis points. And as a result here, you see 10-year uh, Treasury yields uh, continue to move higher. Uh, you begin to see the yield curve uh, actually steepening a little bit, which is more conducive to an economic recovery than it is necessarily to a, a recession. So uh, it'd be interesting to follow that as it develops. Here we have the 10 to two year yield spread. So as I mentioned, the yield curve is beginning to tighten a little bit. If you look at that uh, black line with the 200 day moving average uh, uh, superimposed there, you can see that we've seen this little inflection point as it's uh, demarcated in, in green here that uh, we've seen a trough. And, and now that the, you know, we've, we've seen these uh, spreads begin to widen out a little bit. And so again, you know, a declining spread would be very consistent uh, and an inversion of a yield curve, which we have been in for quite some time, would be much more consistent with uh, with a recession than it would be with a recovery. And so, you know, perhaps this is a symptomatic of, you know, I think is certainly symptomatic of the current sentiment out there, which is that we're going to have a, kind of a soft landing, if you will, uh, albeit with some economic slowing uh, that, uh, but then ultimately uh, here uh, towards the middle 
part perhaps of next year that we'll begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel here for the next market cycle. Here we have a slide referencing the number of times that the, uh, the term soft landing has come up in, in Wall Street Journal articles. And, uh, you know, it's just oftentimes kind of interesting to take a look at some of these things to, to find out the frequency of mention is kind of an indicator of how relevant it is in the financial community. And right now we've seen a huge spike in articles that reference a soft landing. And what's really interesting here, uh, this comes from Jeff Sparshot, uh, his daily note, and uh, they overlay recessions here. And so not always, but often when you get a lot of talk of a soft landing, you wind up getting a recession. And uh, so you can see, you know, going back to, you know, roughly the, the late 80s, you know, you had a lot of talk back then about a soft landing and you actually got a recession. Uh, and mid 90s, a little bit of a false positive there, uh, uh, the spike in soft landings, and you actually got a soft landing. And then you, know, you see 2000, uh, and then 2006 and seven, you wind up getting the global financial crisis. And then not much mentioned before the pandemic, but obviously who can predict that? And uh, and then here we are. So um, you know, a lot of talk now about a soft landing. I actually do think it is achievable. There are a lot of data points that would tend to point to recession, uh, but the consumer by and large is still very strong, although excess savings is working its way down. And so, you know, there's certainly risk out there and, you know, we'll talk, talk about the potential outcomes for the equity market given a scenario where we have this, a soft landing and where we, where we don't, where we actually have a recession. And talking about some of the indicators that would lend itself to a recession, uh, I, I offer this chart uh, or this table right here. Uh, it's, uh, it's an assessment from strategic uh, re research partners as reported in the Fidelity Weekly Note. And I thought it did a really good job of kind of outlining kind of the hits and misses here. I mean, you've got the red X's there in the, in the uh, components of this checklist that would tend that would certainly lend itself to a recession. You've got the ISM again, Institute for Supply Management, new orders. Uh, we've been in contraction for for a while. Uh, the yield curve remain does remain uh, inverted, although as I just mentioned, uh, we're beginning to see an inflection point, so that's good. Financial conditions were still tight uh, there. We've got tight lending standards and. Uh, whatnot, and, uh, uh, and 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 we've actually had you know with the Silicon Valley Bank, you know we're seeing a, a shifting of lending priorities and and banks that are paying more attention to their own balance sheets uh, perhaps than than uh, trying to maintain a growth posture in terms of loan growth. So we do see loan growth beginning to 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 ease up, but then you've got these other. Um, you've got these other categories that are actually doing relatively reasonable. Uh, so you've got housing permits that have picked up. Uh, you actually have uh, some increased confidence going into non-defense capital goods orders. You've got consumer expectations that have uh, that have improved. And then obviously the job market is is holding in there, even though we see some cracks in that. And, and then, uh, and then the last thing that is not checked here is uh, credit spreads are extremely tight, which is completely uh, opposite of what you'd expect if you're heading into a recession. Here we have uh, some data again from Fidelity on what what does a you know, what characterizes a soft and hard landing here, and so. You know, we, we see here um, in inflation, we got these four main categories, labor, wages, and real wages. Um, you know, inflation is still above the Fed's target. And, uh, you know, by their definition here, you know, three and a half percent, you know, it represents under three and a half percent represents a soft landing. Above that represents a hard landing. Right now, we're still a little bit above that. We are trending down. Inflation is a little bit sticky. So, you know, that's, that's maybe a little bit of a caution flag. The labor market, as I mentioned, very, very strong. Uh, unemployment rate is uh, 3.8, still, you know, within striking distance of, you know, 50 year lows. Uh, so that's very, uh, very promising if you're looking, if you're 
hoping for a soft landing, and wages and real wages are both in the same ballpark. You know, we have strong uh, wages, uh, and we have uh, positive real wages now, which is something that we've seen develop over the last several months. And, and those two are, are very conducive to a soft landing. Here we have a little bit of a head check on central banks. We know that um, you know part of this whole tightening is, is what we call the quantitative tightening side of it. And it's if these banks that you know, have these uh, central banks rather uh, have these bloated balance sheets. So they own all of these securities that they've been buying in the open market for all these years. And now they're unwinding that. And so what that means is they're pulling liquidity out of the system. And so that's important from an economic standpoint because that tends to slow growth. And you can see here in most of these areas where you've, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a noisy chart because this represents uh, a handful of several central banks, but uh, you see the total line there in red uh, clearly going negative and so rep representing uh, credit tightening across the board here. Here we have uh, the impact of that tightening on real GDP. Uh, this is monetary tightening. Uh, so it represents on the left hand side, you know, where we are in terms of its impact. Um, you know, we're at third quarter of 2023, uh, heading into the fourth quarter here. So we're, we're essentially seeing the bulk of the monetary tightening now. Now, I showed you a chart prior to where we had uh, the financial conditions index, and that's more of the private sector issues, you know, with credit tightening and whatnot. This represents the monetary tightening and its influence on real GDP. And so we've seen a lot of the financial conditions uh, impact uh, kind of you know it's 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 out there now that will likely manifest itself in slower growth over the next couple of quarters and you can see that kind of like dovetails really nicely here with what's going on with the impact of monetary tightening so we're apt to see the largest impact here over the next couple of quarters and then that and then that wanes over time and so uh, so that drag kind of goes down over time. And then if you look at the forecast on the right-hand side, this is, again, data uh, compiled by Oxford Economics. I love their work. Uh, but you, you can see here, you know, uh, 2024 is highlighted in the far right there, uh, looking for basically a, a little bit of growth, but that's kind of like the, you know, the beginning of the year is a bit more of a drag. The end of the year is positive. Uh, and so the net of that is you get two-tenths of 1%. But here, 2023, we're getting 2.1. And you can see from the quarterly standpoints there in their work, you can see that, you know, they're actually predicting kind of this technical recession where you get two quarters of negative GDP growth. And, you know, again, that might happen. Um, but, uh, uh, but really, there's a lot of data out there that supports just kind of the soft landing where maybe we're not going to get a negative, but we're going to get a really low positive. Here we have uh, the Federal Open Market Committee economic projections and how they have uh, evolved since June. And so I'd say, you know, there's really some positive takeaways here. Again, you know, I'm not going to represent the, the uh, Federal Reserve voting members are the soothsayers and they know everything because they've uh, often been wrong. But at least from their sentiment, and they're watching this data a lot closer than any of us are, but uh, when you go starting on the left-hand side, you got GDP, which is economic growth from June to September. The outlook for all of that has, uh, has, has certainly improved. Um, and you go unemployment rate, you know, the, the change from June to September, you know, the feelings that, that uh, you're gonna get more, you're gonna get a lower economic, uh, excuse me, lower unemployment rate. And then uh, inflation, you know, that looks fairly flat to slightly up. And then core PCI inflation looks flat to kind of maybe slightly up. So the expectations are that inflation is going to be pretty sticky. Unemployment will come down and economic growth will uh, be greater than what was anticipated this summer. We have some conference board uh, data, uh, leading economic indicators. 
And this has been down for 17 months in a row. You can see that in the upper left-hand side. You know, we got the most recent data point. Typically, if you look in the center there at the bottom, the, the negativity of that would uh, would tend to always lend itself to a recession. Again, this is one of those things that you look at and you say, "Oh, we're going to go, to, we're going to go into a recession." And then you've got these other indicators that I showed you, real wages, uh, and you know some other things in the in the other slide <clears throat> that don't tend to lend itself to a recession at all. And so you know that's kind of the quandary that we're in, and the market's a little bit uncertain. So we've seen a little bit of a spike in volatility. There's still some speculation that, you know, is is the Fed, you know, not seeing this, uh, you know, when they talk about maybe raising rates one more time this year, you know, and then there's a general, you know, I guess fear among some people that, you know, that they're going to raise rates too much and it will send us into a recession. And, and we don't know that yet. I mean, you know, I know the Fed is looking at all of this data. We know that inflation is still higher than their target. But uh, but again, you know, it doesn't mean that we're heading towards a recession necessarily. Here we have some uh, information uh, on delinquencies and by age cohort too, which is interesting because we know that the Gen Zers um, are, you know, that rising generation, the Gen Xers uh, and, and the millennials uh, here, you know, uh, but we see default rates for credit cards rising. And, uh, you know, this is, isn't something that started, you know, two months ago. This has kind of been in evolution over the last uh, year or so. But, you know, it's something we want to pay attention to. It's not at a critical juncture yet. You know, a lot of these levels are, you know, the older cohorts are still below the pre-pandemic levels. But the younger cohorts uh, have really spiked up here lately. And so we want to be careful not to assume that we're not going to have a little bit of credit stress uh, here over the coming six months or so. And continuing the theme about the lagged impact uh, of uh, monetary and financial conditions tightening in certain areas of our economy, I offer a couple of more charts for you, which tend to suggest that we're going to have a slower economy. Again, not bad. Not necessarily a recession, but a slower economy. Uh, we've got chart on the left from BCA Research uh, and one on the right from Bloomberg. The one on the left really talks about tightening lending standards that are in response to, uh, in, in some cases, uh, interest rates, but also uh, from you know bank stress overall, balance sheets. You know uh, we've seen that huge rise in interest rates last year which really put uh, Silicon Valley Bank and some of the other regional banks into a real pickle uh, because they were, uh, you know, they had a, a massive asset and liability mismatch. So they've become a lot tighter in their commercial and industrial or, or C&I loans. And so uh, if you advance that line, you see, okay, what's the lagged impact of that? Well, uh, over time, obviously, you're going to see lower C&I loan growth. And so the less loan growth you see, that means that's less money that's being borrowed for expansion of facilities and distribution and markets and things like that. You just see a general slowing that comes from that. On the right-hand side, uh, you have the, um, you have the uh, ISM manufacturing, uh, PMI data, and then the global uh, that's in the black line. The kind of the aqua line there is the global financial tightness indicator. Again, another of these indicators that I talked about uh, and showed you earlier, the uh, financial conditions index. Uh, this is just another version of that. And so, you know, you see that that uh, tightness indicator is um, it, it, it's it's dramatically low right now, and so. You know, what does that do for ISM manufacturing? Well, we know that we've been in a bit of a contraction now and it's apt to remain so for a while. So again, it's thought that we're gonna be in this um, higher for longer uh, period. Uh, it's gonna kind of keep a lid on manufacturing growth, even though we've seen some green shoots out of this contractionary period, but it's just likely to remain sluggish for the time being. We'll spend a minute on the residential housing sector. Uh, I am still looking for some really 
good data on the commercial sector uh, to kind of talk about it a, a little bit. We've got one slide here with regard to industrial. We know that banks are really still willing to lend on industrial properties. They're certainly uh, willing to lend on multifamily, although we've seen a, a pretty dramatic decline in multifamily activity, but this is not that. This is just existing home prices, single family. Uh, we've got existing home sales that are still a bit in the doldrums. Um, you know, you think about the whole supply and demand curve has kind of shifted down. So people are kind of, you know, in some respects stuck. If you've got a below 3% mortgage, you're not in the least bit inclined to want to move and take on something that's, um, you know, that's at least twice that in terms of the mortgage rate. And then, you know, existing home prices have uh, kind of ticked back up again. So you've got this whole affordability issue here that is kind of like impacting on unit uh, volume within the existing home sales side, but you obviously still have new home sales that are rising because you've got builders that are trying to throw out uh, uh, incentives, in some cases buying down the mortgage rates by, by three percentage points or so. Uh, so that is definitely going on. And here we have the 30-year uh, fixed mortgage rate up close to 7.5%. Uh, it continues to meander higher, again, impacting affordability. Here we have warehouse rents. Uh, this is in the industrial sector. And so this is, uh, you know, again, going to the commercial side for a second. I did find this. It was really interesting that we haven't seen any degradation whatsoever in this industrial uh space. Uh, industrial remains very strong. It's a competitive market. It's where, as I mentioned before, banks are still very much willing to lend on this, uh, certainly in particular pockets of the country like Central Texas, where you have a lot of net industrial migration. Uh, but this number continues to move higher. Switch to talk about crude oil uh, right now. Oil prices are moving higher. This is part of the overall inflation basket, you know, as, particularly as it relates to distillates. Uh, that, um, that, you know, when you crack oil and, and you get to gasoline, you get to these other things. Um, and, you know, the, the whole input uh, uh, pipeline now is much more expensive than it was. And in fact, you know, we'll, we'll likely push $100 a barrel before too long. Uh, some of this has a lot to do with supply issues, uh, the curtailments by OPEC plus, particularly Saudi Arabia and Russia. Uh, it also has a lot to do with demand. So, and demand, I, I would say even globally too, but particularly in the U.S. Uh, where we've had a real spike in demand uh, in, in, in terms of, you know, for uh, oil and for uh, gasoline, et cetera. So these prices are likely to remain high, you know, when you have you know, have this, and when you have this translate into higher gasoline prices at the pump, this is one of those things that kind of, you know, in addition with food prices and whatnot, it, you know, it makes the average consumer think, okay, well, I've got less to spend because they're paying, you know, 25 to 35 or whatever more uh, every time to fill up their car because uh, these prices are moving higher. Now we'll pivot a little bit and talk about the investment markets uh, here. Uh, obviously, this is all interrelated, but uh, you know some interesting developments here recently in the stock market. Uh, we can see here on the left-hand side represents the uh, percent of members of both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100 that are trading above their 50-day moving average. And so this is kind of a technical indicator. Uh, you know, shows you how strong the market market is uh, relative to its uh, kind of near term trend line. Uh, I think it's you know it, both of these are are trailing off. So uh, obviously we've seen a bit more volatility now. We've seen markets that have kind of reversed a little bit. Uh, I think there is a silver lining in this in the sense that we have had you know the overall. I'll just use the S and P 500 as an example. The S and P 500 is a capitalization weighted index. And so, you know, after the roughly March around the Silicon Valley Bank, we had all of these, all of these, we had these very, very select few uh, stocks that were tied to artificial intelligence that really took off and the rest of the market kind of languished for a while. Well, when you have a little bit of volatility like we've seen over the last week or two, uh, and you see this data can 
kind of trail off where we're kind of like, you know, we're not uh, seeing as many stocks that are above their moving averages. Uh, what that means in, in terms of that silver lining that I was talking about is that you, you'll probably see more of a coalescence between the equal weight, which is just, you know, means that every uh, stock in the index has an equal influence on uh, on return. Uh, you'll see that begin to kind of like dovetail a little bit more closely with the overall index and, and you know, where we've seen that huge gap year to date. So anyway, more volatility. Uh, and honestly, we, we were coming off a period where we had pretty low volatility in the index. And so it was apt to pick up a little bit. Uh, and then I turn your attention to what we see here on the right hand side. And this is just the correlation, 60 day correlation between the S&P 500 stock index and the TLT, which is the long term bond index. And, you know, when you see in this data series going back to 2005, that you haven't seen the kind of correlation that we have right now. And it's very odd, actually. Uh, you typically see these moving in different directions. And, you know, and, and this is one of those things that we look at and, um, you know, and, and this is like diversification 101. When they move opposite, you know, you want a counterweight to when equity markets are you know, going down that you've got bonds that are going up and that's typically, you know, how it goes. But right now it's interesting that both are kind of moving in the same direction. In light of the uh, last slide, I wanted to show you this uh, it's from Deutsche Bank, uh, but reprinted in the Daily Shot newsletter. Really interesting stuff, a lot of data here. It goes back to 1800, so it shows you the real returns. Again, that's those are the nominal returns kind of, you know, impacted by inflation. So basically taking, uh, you know, the the realized returns and subtracting out inflation to get to real returns. And you can see that over a long period of time, you know, you generally are going to have positive performance out of both equities and fixed income. And when you have periods of very high inflation, uh, you know, those real returns can be negative, uh, but you, know, you see the purchasing power over a long period of time is generally very, very positive. So when we look at uh, the market uh, year to date, uh, obviously it's a better environment than we had last year. Thank goodness for that. Um, you know, where is that coming from? And we talk a lot about earnings and kind of like speculation that earnings are going to degrade and, or, you know, earnings estimates might be a little bit too high. And, you know, those are all valid kind of conversations. But, you know, what we can see here clearly is that, you know, the S&P 500 return and that dotted red line, as you look at 2023, were positive. But most of that has come from multiple uh, expansion, which is in that dark blue. And earnings growth is in the, uh, is in that light gray. And so we just haven't had that this year. In fact, you know, you could argue that maybe it's been a little bit of a drag uh, on on earnings and may continue to be a drag. But, uh, you know, the question is, as we look ahead and in 2024, you know, are we going to get multiple expansion? Uh, if you have a little bit of an economic slowdown, I'd say the chances are probably not. But if you have earnings estimates that, you know, are likely to get real conservative, people are going to want to kind of hold their chips to their vest. And, you know, what we typically see is that they, they overdo it. And then when you realize, okay, well, if we hit that soft landing and we're sitting here having this conversation, probably, you know, call it February of next year, then chances are really good that those uh, people become a little bit more, they've realized that they've been too pessimistic and they're going to increase their, uh, their estimates uh, heading into the latter half of uh, 2024. And so I think there's a real opportunity, maybe in a very ironic sense that earnings could be a driver of the S&P next year. Uh, but, uh, you know, I do, I want to caution to say that that's a, you know, that's a beginning point to an end point. I think the journey between those two points um, may be, may have a little bit more volatility. We might see, you know, a little bit of a correction uh, before going back up again. So I just want to caution that, you know, you know, looking at 2024, you know, I'm, I'm actually a little bit optimistic, uh, on, on 
stock returns, uh, but just know that that journey is not going to be a straight line. And here we have the estimate for the next 12 months of uh, earnings uh, out of the S&P 500 index. And so this is kind of a, a rolling estimate here. So if you, the way to read this is that uh, we sit here on the eve of October. The current estimate for the next 12 months worth of earnings out of the S&P 500 is about 237, which at today's index value is about 18.2 times uh, forward earnings. And so you think about that relative to history, you know, a long-term average might be 16.5% or 16.5 times rather. And we've been as certainly as high as like 22. And uh, again, this is the S&P 500 index, which we know has been dominated by those artificial intelligence, magnificent seven stocks, if you will. And, um, and you can also see that estimates have come up too. So uh, you know, to my point earlier that you, you tend to get optimistic and, and these things go in waves. So you analysts get optimistic and then they realize, oh, well, we're going to have a soft landing. Well, we need to bring these estimates back down. And then they realize that they were too conservative. And so they go back up again. And so this is the kind of the nature of things. But, you know, as we stare out to 2024, obviously we're at a bit of a high point right now. I could see these estimates beginning to fall uh, a little bit before going back up again. But, you know, if you look at 18 times earnings, that's not out of line. Uh, and it doesn't represent an environment that's like really cheap, but it certainly doesn't represent an environment where it's extremely expensive. We have a chart here from Bloomberg, which kind of highlights, uh, you know, the two different outcomes uh, that we see in the market. So, you know, by and large, you know, at the end of a Fed uh, rate tightening cycle, you tend to see uh, better, uh, uh, better performance out of the uh, stock market. So this is the S&P 500. So if you don't have a recession, you know, in that black line, the market's going to go up and, you, you know, you've got the opportunity there to go up, you know, 15% from 184 days, which is, you know, call it, you know, half of a year, six months. So you know, just think about it like you could go six months after the last tightening by the Federal Reserve, uh, you could be up 15%. But if you have a recession in that same time frame, you could be down about 10%, perhaps. So, you know, the big if right now, markets are really wrestling with this. Is, is, is this going to be a soft landing? Or is it going to be a recession? Uh, again, I've shown you two, you know, very, you know, distinct pools of data that would argue uh, on on either side. And so, when it what it really comes down to in terms of where the market is going to go over the next 12 months is is can we avoid the policy mistake by the Fed raising rates too much? Um, is uh, consumer behavior going to? It doesn't have to be strong. It just has to not be incredibly weak and and so far it's it's actually held in pretty well consumer uh, the consumer has really been the big surprise of 2023 thus far so i think this is really good because it shows you the two you know outcomes depending on if you have a recession or not uh and and it's robust data because it actually includes all uh data uh from rate tightening cycles uh, going back to 1971. I'm going to stay on the earnings theme here for a bit longer because uh, I think, you know, some of this data is really interesting. Uh, you know, you can see on the left-hand side data from Bloomberg as reported by Fidelity here that, you know, in 2023, the year that we're in right now, you know, we're seeing earnings growth expectations down slightly. And just like I've been talking about, those can kind of, they vary over time, right? And so right now, you know, that we're apt to be uh, down around 3%. And, uh, but looking out to 2024, the estimates are now up for about 11% in earnings. And you can see earnings sales and margin estimates there, you know, looking for about 4% sales growth, uh, and operating margins uh, really fairly strong and then earnings growth there about 11%. You know, could change, uh, you know, the business cycle averages on the right-hand side, actually going back to 1950, 
kind of show you what I kind of highlighted to you in that last slide is that, you know, if you have a recession, then, you know, you should expect to see earnings uh, go down instead of up, right? That's not the consensus estimate now. And so um, you would expect it to, you know, in a soft landing to look a little bit more like the late cycle version of this as opposed to the recession. So, but, you know, it's not a catastrophe if you have a recession that you typically see about a 10% erosion there. And as we saw in that last slide that, you know, stocks in that type of an environment after the last Fed rate tightening uh, exercise, you know, uh, can, you know, be down around 10%. Uh, again, that's not the calamity that we saw a year ago, but, um, you know, again, the, the preponderance of the data suggests that we're heading towards that slowdown, but without that recession. One thing I did want to mention, though, is we've been talking about interest rates moving higher in our country, that uh, global interest rates are also moving higher. And, you know, we've seen a pretty profound impact on the dollar. Uh, we'll have uh, a quick note on that. But you can see here the uh, global aggregate index yield uh, is up above uh, four, uh, about 4.2 all almost. And you can see how how that's gone up considerably over time. And, you know, you know you've got to go back to kind of the post uh, or maybe around the global financial crisis, you know, when we saw rates that were that were this high on a global scale. Here's a chart on the uh, U.S. dollar. Uh, it has been strong. Obviously, we've been in a rate tightening phase. And so when you do that, uh, at, at a more accelerated pace than some of the other central banks around the world, you tend to have a strengthening currency, and that's exactly what we've had here. I thought I'd end on this slide, more of a demographic uh, conversation here. Uh, you know, we've, we've talked a lot at various points over the last year about China and, and its uh, economic growth track and whatnot. Obviously, they have the shutdowns related to COVID, and then they reopened, and people were optimistic, and then that kind of petered out a little bit. And you know, th those are more near-term dynamics. But when you think about China from a secular, medium to long-term standpoint, um, you know, it, it, you have to look at population and the one-child policy, and how that was really lifted and changed too late to kind of help save the growth of that whole generation. Uh, or two uh, in the Chinese, um, you know, uh, population. And so we see the, those levels uh, definitely moving lower in, in kind of a dovetail with Japan, which I thought this is really interesting. So this is World Bank data that's reported by the Wall Street Journal in an article kind of talking about the influence of China on the global economy. And we know that, uh, you know, over, you know, the last 20 years that, you know, some people might call it the Chinese miracle, but you know, that they've had really strong growth rates and that have been actually very highly influential on overall global growth, where China's accounted for a tremendous percentage of overall world uh, economic growth. And if that's going to stall as we look ahead over the next decade, then, you know, the growth is going to have to come from someplace else. You know, as in the U.S.'s role in, in that will increase, as will Europe and maybe even some of these other emerging, you know, market economies that that are bigger than most, like say Brazil or India, for that matter. And you know, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. There's really no near-term, you know, implications that I feel like I need to convey to you based on this chart, but just something that uh, that I intend to read a lot more about, and I think will become uh, more greatly discussed uh, here in the uh, years ahead. That's all we have this week. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the chart pack. hope you have a great week, and we'll talk to you again soon.